Hello, lovely internet strangers. So let's talk about the emotional labor of sensitivity reading and not using sensitivity readers as your shields. I remember when I was working in publishing, there was an author that I was familiar with in the sci-fi fantasy space, who I believe is non-binary, and they were doing a sensitivity read for someone and they tweeted about the emotional labor involved and how traumatic it was. Across these posts, the emotional labor of the sensitivity reads was acknowledged that it is challenging, that if you're one of these readers, coming across racial stereotypes. It can be a demoralizing experience, an exhausting experience. One person said that in reading biased representations of her own ethnic group, she was confronted over and over again with the impression that society doesn't see her as completely human. Also, the sensitivity readers have to deal with authors getting defensive. And yeah, authors get defensive about everything, not just from feedback from sensitivity readers, about feedback from their editors, from their agents, from their beta readers. As I've mentioned, in a previous video, a lot of authors are adult babies. Take it from someone who worked with a lot of authors and who read hundreds of queries from authors. That doesn't mean they're bad people. They're just sensitive and defensive about their work. Now, as I mentioned, the editors of that book, The Continent, broke NDAs and used their sensitivity readers as shields. And sensitivity readers are very clear on this. Just because you get a sensitivity read from one person does not prevent you from making mistakes. It doesn't matter how many sensitivity readers you get. If you get 12, if you get 50, people are allowed to be offended by your work because you're not going to get it all right, especially when you're writing outside of your experience. Even if you're writing in your experience such that you're a person of Mexican ethnicity, writing about a character of Mexican ethnicity doesn't mean that you growing up Mexican in Los Angeles is the same as you trying to write a Mexican character who grew up in Washington, D.C. Something I want to point out is that, yeah, there are times when people are super egregious in not doing their research and pretty much everyone who reads the book can tell that this does not seem authentic and it ruins enjoyment of the book in general. They haven't written a good story. But sometimes only certain people are going to notice. Like for example, I read a book when I was in a book club that took place in the specific area where I'm from and clearly they had not done their research as to how people would refer to things in that area and it was super jarring to me to read because I was like no one would refer to that highway that way. But the people I was in the book club with did not find details like that jarring because they did not have that level of knowledge. But but the reason it is super important to point things like this out is because of the concept of harm. In an article about a panel on the concept of sensitivity readers, there was a bookseller, Kenny Breckner, who owns Devaney, Doak, and Garrett booksellers in Farmington, Maine, said, quote, the free expression of ideas is the lifeblood of bookselling, and that the fear of being publicly castigated on the grounds of perpetuating stereotypes in one's work is having a negative impact upon the free flow of ideas in the book industry, particularly in the children's book world. He said there is a fear among writers of, quote, having their project torpedoed, fear of being called out and shamed on social media, fear of having their careers ruined. The lever which allows fear to overturn free speech is harm, the imputing of harm to books and ideas. He listed the five types of harm, which were exclusion slash erasure, reading sentences I can't unread, personal bias, deception, and triggers. The reading sentences I can't unread is a big one. If you look at the book blogging world, if you look at the reviews that you'll see on Goodreads in particular, people talking about how triggering this book was and they wish they hadn't read it. This is why the content warnings popped up because reading this book could be mentally harmful to people, etc, etc. This bookseller, Breckner, suggested that instead what the publishing industry should be doing is to let the market decide on a book's merits or lack thereof, and booksellers should promote great books written by diverse authors that might otherwise be overlooked. He said, quote, books have the right to succeed or fail in a critical marketplace, not through a fear of suppression. Books have a right to fail, to be bad. And he said that booksellers, quote, have a lot of influence, and he said that they should share their opinions about possibly problematic books with one another, but readers and booksellers have to decide for themselves what it is worth their time to read and what is not. He also said, quote, books are vast interior spaces and no one can know what complex connection a reader forms within them. And that quote, that readers will respond to the books that they read through their own unique life experiences. And so what may offend one reader may not offend another from a similar background. You don't say. Publishers are often making an economic decision. It's all well and good for a bookseller to say that the book should 
could fail on its own merits, but publishers don't want their books to fail. So if they're given signals from their target demographic that they're not going to buy the book, that they're not having it, so to speak, they may decide to pull the book or they may shy away from being in the position to pull a book. So they may stop buying books from white authors about characters of color, or they get sensitivity readers to help out their authors to cover their asses, so to speak. Let's talk a little more about the concept of harm and how these inaccurate portrayals can harm people. So the sensitivity reader crowd basically argues that there have been harmful stereotypes that have been perpetuated and blindly believed in our culture about marginalized communities, which includes people of color, LGBTQ+, people with disabilities, etc. One person said that if we just publish these books, then, quote, harmful stereotypes find their way into our everyday lives and perpetuate injustices and prejudices against these communities. And they also point out that the sensitivity readers are educating the author and the editor by pointing out inaccuracies in the current manuscript. They are training the author and editor how to be more inclusive in the future. So hopefully next time they will catch what they missed the first time. Let me just tell you how educate is just one of my favorite words ever. I just love it when people talk about how they want to educate people. Let's talk about a couple of sensitivity read examples that I came across that I found interesting. One was from Danielle Clayton from We Need Diverse Books. She gave an example about a middle grade book where a little black girl loves to go to national parks and she told the author that she needed to figure out how the black girl got interested in going to national parks because in the past black people weren't allowed to visit them and so as a consequence in the modern era going to national parks is not a thing that they do in in general. So if this little girl loves to camp, you need to figure out how that happened, how her passion came about, how did her parents and grandparents feel about it, or you have to make her white because otherwise it's a paint by numbers diversity piece and it rings false. Now I'm not going to disagree with her that that's a detail that should be figured out. However, this is something that you would need to figure out regardless of the race of your character. If your character is into camping and going to national parks, how did that happen? Not every kid is into camping or going to national parks. I saw certainly wasn't. I'm half white or full white, depending on how you want to describe Latino people. And we sure as heck never went camping or went to national parks. I took a school trip to a national park once, but it wasn't for camping. And if a little girl is going camping, how? Who's taking her? Is she going with the family of some friends? Is there some camping club at school? I mean, how old is this kid? These are the things that you should think about. Even if you don't put all of the details into your book, at the very least, you should know the entire backstory of your character. I'm currently working on a novel and I've put a lot of thought into developing each of the characters so that they are fully fleshed out and their whole world makes sense. Here's an example of the kinds of things that I've been thinking about for this novel. I thought I wanted to write a young adult novel about really deep friendship and I wanted to write about both of the characters struggling with mental illness, connecting through music, playing in a band together, and I wanted to set it in the 90s and I thought a lot about where could I set this novel where two teenagers in the 90s could be in a band and they could play gigs together. Could I set it in New York City? And then I thought about what are the backgrounds of those characters? What are their ethnicities? What would their families be like? What are the circumstances of those families? How much money do they have? Are they strict? Are they not? You have to think through logistics for your characters. If my character is going to go play a gig in a band and she's 17, are her parents cool with this? Is she going to have to lie to them? How does she manage to sneak around without them finding out how do the characters get around? Do they drive, take public transportation, and so on. So much of what people describe when they're doing these sensitivity reads is that the writing is just bad. These characters are not fully fleshed out. I can give an example from when I worked in publishing. There was an author I knew who asked me to essentially do a sensitivity read, although he didn't use that exact term. This was before the sensitivity reader craze. He asked me to read his book for accurate depiction of the female characters because he's a man and obviously no men have ever written female characters before accurately because, you know, we're just like these aliens that they can't possibly understand. We were kind of friends at the time in addition to our professional association, and I think he respected my opinion. At the time, I was still a feminist, so a lot of my feminist brain was chafing at the way he depicted this female character. But even then, I was still able to articulate to him that the problem with this female character was largely the fact that she was merely a stereotype 
stereotype. Not that she happened to be depicted with certain characteristics that are stereotypical, but that her entire character was just a cardboard cutout. She was clearly a woman that was his dream girl that he had just written onto the page. She was the wife of someone in the military. Basically her whole character was like, I'm super tough lady with tattoos. I don't relate to the other military wives because they just do their knitting circle. I don't know how to cook for myself because I'm just such a badass. And I was like, not knowing how to cook for yourself does not make you badass. Everyone should know how to cook for themselves. His whole characterization of her was just being like, here's what I think a stereotypical woman is like, and she's not that. She did not have a developed internal world and backstory and nuances to her and motivations. If he just sat down and was like, where is this character from? What does she want? What is she afraid of? What motivates her? How did she end up with this military man? Give us a reason she doesn't know how to cook. An example I came across in one of these articles was about a book that I have specifically read and loved. It's a YA novel called Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, which was turned into a movie called Love, Simon. The book is about a gay kid who hasn't come out yet. He knows his parents will be supportive, but his parents are kind of overbearing and he feels like they'll become a little too involved. He's afraid to tell his best friends, not because he thinks they will hate him, but just because they've known each other forever and it's gonna be a shock to them. Like, how do we not know this about you? And he's secretly exchanging emails with someone he doesn't know the actual identity of. He just knows that they go to his school. He knows that they're also a gay kid and he's falling for this person. And he's also a theater kid and antics ensue. And it's a really funny book. My husband could hear me laughing in the other room because I just couldn't help myself. And the author gave an example in this article of a criticism she got after the book came out. In the book, Simon, the protagonist, muses that girls have an easier time coming out than boys because their lesbianism strikes others as alluring. She was told at a book signing that the scene played too readily into the narrative that they had heard many times before. And online, I'm sure it was on Goodreads or Tumblr, people condemned the fetishization of queer girls in the book as offensive. And the author originally hadn't thought about that passage at all because obviously the character was unworldly. There's another passage where he says that all Jews come from Israel, but the reader said that, yeah, but in that exchange, his Jewish friend immediately corrects him, whereas the lesbian line was in the interior monologue of the character, so no one corrected him. What the actual fuck? He's a fucking teenage boy who had a fucking thought. People don't just go around thinking correct thoughts all the time. And also, where's the lie though? People who are not lesbians often find lesbianism alluring. He didn't say that he finds lesbianism alluring or it's good that people feel that way. You're not gonna be depicting accurate teenagers if they can't have a problematic internal monologue. Because I know that everyone watching this video, if they think back to the things that they thought when they were a teenager, they would all be drawn and quartered in the court of public social justice opinion, no matter how woke they may have grown up to be. So for her next book, she got 12 sensitivity readers because there were LGBTQ characters, black characters, Korean American, etc. And one of the notes she got from the black sensitivity readers was there is a black college student and she had described him as a bro, the kind of frat boy that she'd gone to school with in Connecticut. But the sensitivity readers were like, nope, that's not a thing because historically black college colleges have a very different conception of Greek life and the members are much more like superstar athletes rather than the stereotypical bro image and the author had to rethink that character. And I'm like, why do you need a sensitivity reader for that? If you're writing about black characters who went to a historically black college, then do a little research about fraternity culture at historically black colleges. It's not that hard. And then she also talks about a note from one of her other sensitivity readers who saw an opportunity to have an interesting confrontation to challenge one of society's myths about gay parents. So on the advice of this sensitivity reader, the author made this really douchey guy named Evan suggest to a queer character that her family had raised her to be queer. And when he makes the comment, he's met by awkward silence, so it's clear the other characters firmly disapprove. And the author said she was happy to orchestrate the teachable moment, and she realized it wasn't just a socially conscious improvement, but a narrative one, and she loved that moment in the book. Now, I haven't read her second book, 
book. I can't speak to how that moment played out, but it sounds super over the top and cringe to me. Anytime you're trying to orchestrate a teachable moment instead of just writing a story, usually it's not a good idea. If you're writing a good story, you will give the readers things to think about. You can make people learn things without thinking about the teachable moments. There was some discussion in some of these articles about, well, what about all these historical classics? And if we had taken the sensitivity reader approach to them, we wouldn't have them. And someone discussed the distinction between offensive descriptions and the ones that are being blessed by the author. So for example, if Lolita had been written from Dolores's point of view, it might have been useful to have an advocate of children's rights, a childhood sexual assault survivor, or a psychologist read the manuscript and give critique. But since it was told from the perspective of a pedophile, not regarded as a marginalized group, that wasn't necessary. One article writer did kind of make a comment about the fact that cultural sensitivities fluctuate over time and what will the readers of the future make of ours. But one person said when responding to this whole notion about the historical classics, well, who could object to a procession of To Kill a Mockingbirds that evince a bit more alertness to the nuances of the minority experience? Where is the flaw? I mean, really? I'm gonna close out with some thoughts from Ryan Holiday in a Colette piece that he wrote about his experience using a sensitivity reader. He's working in the realm of nonfiction, so his experience was pretty okay, but he kind of echoes what I said, that the key is good writing. And a lot of these issues crop up when you just aren't writing good characters or a good story. And the professionals that we already have in place are already doing a lot of work to ensure that. Unfortunately, a lot of mediocre books get published anyway, but that's a whole other can of worms. The main thing that jumped out at me from his piece was that he referenced Fahrenheit 451. And Fahrenheit 451 is a book that I read in the 10th grade and did not appreciate. But now, especially in current year, especially over the last few years, I really appreciate it. And I wish that I had a shirt depicting Fahrenheit 451 that I could wear. So many people misunderstand the message of this book, especially people on the left. The key point in Fahrenheit 451 is not about what happens when the government censors you. It's about what happens when society starts self-censoring to make sure that no one is offended, to keep everyone happy. Captain Beatty, Beatty, I never knew how to pronounce it, tells our protagonist, Montag, that, quote, it didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with, no. You must understand that our civilization is so vast that we can't have our minorities upset and stirred. Ask yourself, what do we want in this country above all? People want to be happy, isn't that right? Colored people don't like little black Sambo, burn it. White people don't feel good about Uncle Tom's cabin, burn it. Someone's written a book on tobacco and cancer of the lungs. The cigarette people are weeping, burn the book. Serenity, Montag. Peace, Montag. Take your fight outside. Better yet, to the incinerator. And my husband actually just made a comment to me that things could be worse, that the left isn't literally burning books in the streets yet. But is that that far off? I don't know. It's not that hard for me to imagine a scenario where people are coming to your house to uh, check if you have problematic material just wait till the firefighters are busting down your door. Writers are in a hard place with this because writers have these stories they want to tell, but white writers in particular got told that we already have enough of your stories. We need the diverse characters. So they start writing them. Oh, but you can't write them. Or you can try, but you have to get all these sensitivity readers and you can still mess up. You can still be called out and dragged and have your career ruined. And you need to just own your mistakes and sit there and take it. And writers want to get published. So so they try to do what people tell them to do that will get them published. But you're between a rock and a hard place because if you write authentically, you might not get published. But if you try to do what they say, you might get published, but your career might be ruined. I don't know what's gonna happen to change this situation. Like I said, I don't think it's as bad in certain other areas of publishing beyond children's and YA and sci-fi fantasy. I'm not sure to what extent it's happening in the romance genre. I do know there's a huge push for diversity in that genre, and I'll probably make videos about that at a certain point. The only advice that I can give to people that are trying to get published now is to write good characters. No matter what the race or ethnicity of your character is, think through all the logistics of their life. Think through their fears and dreams. Think about how they came to have the interests that they do. How do they afford them? What do other people think about their interests and pursuits? About the way they look? Do they conform? Do they stand out? Are they just going to be marginalized for the way they are or are they actually in danger? If you're writing a historical novel, do your research. If you're writing a contemporary novel in a place where you've never
never lived. Do your research. Someone who's lived in a city their entire life knows nothing about what it's like to live in a suburb, for real. They might have seen it on TV, but that's the same as people who've lived in a suburb their whole life seeing a city on TV. The internet is your oyster. You can go on forums. You can watch people talking about their experiences on YouTube. Why do I know so much about what it's like to be a sex worker, to be a stripper, to be a cam girl? Because at a certain time on YouTube, all these chicks were coming out and just vlogging about their experiences. And I just watched hours of these women talking about it. It's all out there. So that is my recommendation to you. The best thing that you can do is write fleshed out characters, three-dimensional people, not cardboard cutouts. Think through all of your choices with your characters and your plot. And for those of you who are just readers, the modern publishing landscape is pretty hit or miss. You might be better off reading some older books, not gonna lie. If you're ever looking for book recommendations from someone who takes a non-SJW perspective, I have plenty of recommendations for all types of readers. So even for as much as I talked, I could have gone way more in depth on this topic. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, etc., you can leave a comment below. Thank you all for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.